Welcome everyone. Good afternoon or evening as the case may be to another uh, session of Biotherapy Live. Today we are joined by Dr. Mum Choglu, who uh, I want to introduce briefly before he begins uh, to, to teach us all more about maggot therapy. He received his bachelor's degree and doctorate from the University of Basel in Switzerland in both zoology and dermatology. And is currently professor at the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem. He teaches there and has been doing his research for nearly 40 years. He is also at or has been appointed to the faculty of numerous other universities in Switzerland, Turkey, Iran, and elsewhere. He is well known for his research in parasitic arthropods, such as lice and bed bugs, midges and fleas, mites and ticks. And for the past 30 years, he has been a leading force for research and clinical care in maggot therapy and leech therapy, hence his connection with biotherapy. In addition to being a member of multiple scientific societies, he is chair of several, including the International Bio uh, Biotherapy Society, IBS. Uh, Dr. Mamchoglu has received multiple awards for outstanding achievement, including the Better Foundations Award for uh, the William S. Baer Award for the Advancement of Biotherapy. So without further ado, um, I welcome you all to hear today's talk entitled Maggot Therapy, The Israeli Experience. And let's, uh, uh, well, Dr. Mumchoglu, you already have the controls. You can start your presentation. I thank Dr. Ron Sherman for his introductory remarks and uh, for his nice words. Uh, I will share my screen and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, as it was said, and you can see it on the right side, I'm a biologist, I said, a parasitologist, and even more so, a medical entomologist. Accordingly, all the treatments which we will we'll see soon, I did it. It was done under the supervision and the responsibility of the treating physician. <clears throat> I'm working in the, at the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical School. Uh, I'm going to talk to you on some aspects of maggots biology to better understand how maggots debride the wound, what should be done before the beginning of treatment. I will show you several pictures before and after maggot therapy by stressing the advantages of this treatment modality on different chronic wound types the combination of maggot therapy with surgical debridement, the possible, possible zite effects, the negative effects of skin maceration, some details regarding the patients who were treated in Israel with maggot therapy, and I will finish my presentation with some concluding remarks. <clears throat> As uh, it is well known, the females, for example, of the green butterfly, Lucilia sericata, lay their eggs on all kinds of organic, usually decaying material. And as such, the eggs are contaminated with mi microorganisms. In the laboratory, those eggs are e exteriorly disinfected and the hatching larvae are kept in a sterile medium until they are used for the treatment. As you all know, there are three larval stages. 
the third one develops to a pupa and later to an adult fly. Maggots do not have a head, as such they are acephalic creatures and do not have legs. For their locomotion, they are using their body movements. If you want, we can compare with a snake. And the two teeth, which you see here on the right side, which as we will see later are responsible for causing pain inside the wound. We in Israel, uh, having measured the weight of the maggots during their development, concluded that the first instar larva is too small, circa one millimeter in length, and accordingly its ability to ingest necrotic tissue in the coming 24 hours is too small, as you can see in this part. Therefore, we are using the second instar larvae, which develop exponentially in the following 24 hours. And during this time, each of them ingests circa 25 milligram of slough. And if we multiply this with 100, 400, and even 800 maggots per treatment, it becomes quite obvious that the larva can ingest grams of necrotic tissue just within 24 hours and even much more. So if they are left an additional day on the wound. A lot it was said uh, about the excretion and secretion products of the maggots. Just to make a little bit order, uh, the anatomy of the larva is, looks this way, here is the mouth, the food enters the esophagus and first it arrives to the crop. Thereafter, it is directed to the esophagus and via midgut and hindgut, it, become, it arrives to anus. As you can see in this picture, in the front part of the, of the head, let's say, or apical part of the larva, they are the salivary glands. Medicinal larvae secrete with their saliva also enzymes and predigest the food outside their body. That is an extracorporeal digestion, while the partially digested food is later ingested by the maggots. Inside their digestive system, Enzymes and antibacterials are excreted, which further digest the food and neutralize the bacteria which were ingested together with food. And part of these enzymes and antibacterials are also secreted through the anus, which can help par partially digest the sloughy material inside the wound and neutralize bacteria in the surrounding of the wound which again, again is inside the wound. Maggots are usually placed directly on the wound using a cage-like tracing, also known as free range maggot application. For this purpose, adhesive bands uh, are applied on the periphery of the wound. Uh, and uh, the wound and a sterile piece of uh, nylon netting slightly larger than the wound, but smaller than the first layer of the hydrocolloid tape is attached with adhesive tapes on the top of the first layer, leaving an opening through which the maggots are introduced before, of course, the dressing is hermetically closed as you can see in this picture. The netting, which prevents maggots from escaping, allows air to reach the maggots and facilitates the drainage of liquefied necrotic tissue with the help of absorbing gauze and pads on the top of the dressing. As an alternative application mode, maggots that are concealed between two thin layers of polyvinyl 
alcohol netting are used, which is known as contained or concealed maggots, as well as teabag or biobag techniques. I said saliva and together with it, proteolytic enzymes are excreted from maggots. Those excretion can reach the wound through the netting and digest the necrotic material without a direct contact of the maggots with the wound. Without entering much to the details, free range maggots are able to debride quite quicker chronic wounds than the concealed maggots and that are able to debride also deep wounds, undermined areas such sinuses, tract, and crevices. While the concealed maggots are as aesthetically more acceptable, cause less pain, can be left for longer periods on the wound, which is important for weekends, and no adhesive bands or hydrocolloid strips are necessary to be attached around the wound, which sometimes can be also problematic. What are the important steps before the beginning of the treatment? And this, especially if it is not your patient and if you are not yourself a physician, as it is in my case. Discuss the case with the responsible physician after having seen the wound. Explain what, according to your experience, maggots could do and its limits to debride the wound and within which time period. Explain also to the patient who you are and what you are doing and what you are going to do. Get the necessary written consent from the physician and patient or legal guardian. Fill in the treatment protocols. Ask the help of, a, for example, a nurse. Photograph the wound and put together the material which is necessary for the treatment. In the following slides, I will show you a series of pictures of treated, pa of treated patients with uh, minimum information about the history of the patient or of the wound. And by stressing the advantages or, of maggot therapy in the debridement of different chronic wounds. Sorry. Uh, this was my first patient. And though in the meantime, I treated more than 600 patients, this case is, in my opinion, the most spectacular. The 83 years old patient has had already an amputation of his left leg. And his second leg was in danger to be amputated. The patient was not ready for such intervention and the desperate physician was looking for a solution. He asked me if I knew what maggot therapy is and after reading the articles of Ron Sherman, I said, yes, that I knew it, but never use it. As an entomologist, I immediately caught some flies, let them oviposit, disinfected them, and within a week, I started treating his wound while I was spending endless worried and sleepless nights. Uh, as you can see, the entire lower part of his foot was necrotic. The maggots were able to separate the necrotic part of the wound from the living one. And after weeks of treatment, uh, I, can, I hope you can see it here, uh, the necrotic tissue was removed by the maggots and at the end the wound was completely debrided. And when I saw the patient after several months, the size of the wound surface declined dramatically and the patient was able to walk inside his house. Due to lack of experience, this treatment lasted for almost three months. I can, however, assure you today that this wound could be completely debrided within a week. 
This patient was also a candidate for amputation. He declined and looked for solutions for additional six months. Uh, if you can uh, uh, silence this person, please. When he heard about maggot therapy, he asked if he could be treated by maggots. After only three treatments, three treatment cycles, the wound was clean. Here we see only the tendons, which the maggots cannot digest. After a month, the size of the wound declined considerably. And after three additional months, the wound was healed. We saw the patient six years later and he continued walking with both legs. This patient was previously, previously infected with an aggressive bacterium, which destroyed the entire skin of his left leg. He was treated with maggots. And within two weeks, his entire leg was completely clean from the sloughy material, including the, the foot, which you see it here. And please pay attention to these small islands here, which you see it here and here. Uh, oh, which remained intact and were not affected by maggot therapy. Here you can see some dead skin, which is not sloughy, and this was removed by surgically. Here I show you a case of a patient who was suffering from, for months from superficial wound in both sides of his left foot. We treated first one of the wound, which was completely debrided within 18 hours. The following day, we treated the second wound in the opposite side of the first one. And here too, the wound was clean after 18 hours of maggot therapy. Because the maggots are excreting their enzymes and digesting extracorporeally the necrotic tissue, they are capable in removing the most superficial sloughy material, which will be almost impossible to do it with surgical intervention. As you saw it also in the previous pictures, after maggot therapy, the wound is covered with granulation, which helps, of course, in the healing of the wound. That kind of small wounds could be treated within, with 10 to 20 maggots within 24 hours. It is not necessary, of course, to pour uh, on the entire vial with several hundreds of maggots. And usually the following day, the wound is completely debrided. And as it is known, uh, smaller wounds after a thorough debridement can close heal most of the time, as you can see on all these cases, which is of course not always the case with larger wounds. In this particular case, the patient who was suffering from an autoimmune disease had over 30 wounds in his left leg, was treated with free range maggots and all, of, all wounds were debrided within a very short time as you can see it also here and here. Sometimes it is difficult to know how deep the wound is. However, as long as the maggots leave the wound bigger as compared to the size when they first introduced to the wound, we can be quite sure that there is still necrotic tissue inside the wound and continue the treatment until not a significant change in the site of maggots after 24 hours can be seen. With their small size, maggots can enter any part of the wound where sloughy material exists, and so they can debride also sinuses. And in this particular case, we saw larvae coming from one wound to the other through the sinuses under the skin 
and they were cleaning also the slough which was in these sinuses, plus in these pockets under the skin, which we don't see it when we look to the, to the wound exteriorly. Here is, of course, the final uh, result and, and again, a tendon which can be seen. Uh, as with any other method, removal of the necrotic tissue from a wound will prevent the spreading of the wound to healthy parts of the skin. As we can see it in this case where the infection of the removed wound, removed toe had a negative effect on the toes next to it, as you can see it here. I will show you very quickly some more case of wound clinic by Maggot, just to convince you even more how effective the, the Maggot therapy is. Here, an example, another one. Here is our all kinds of remains of tendons which were destroyed while the wound was open, as you can see it here. Also here, what we see, the granulatic tissue and the tendons and the muscles here too. This patient who was Im immobile for months due to a wound in each of his foot started moving around quite freely after maggot therapy. Maggots are also able to enter under the gangrene and by debriding the sloughy material there are capable in detaching removing the gangrene from the wound, as you can see it in this case. Maggots are used also for the debridement of pressure sores, as can be seen in this case, just to give you an example, and I will talk about uh, surgical interventions as well, but as soon as after one or two cycles, this big necrotic tissue is detached from the living tissue, and for the surgeon, it's very easy to remove these large decrotic parts and leave to the maggots the, the slough and the necrotic tissue, which is superficial and which could be more difficult be removed with surgical interventions. Here I show you another case of pressure sore before and after treatment. And here a last one and remind you that the wound is not what we see from above, but there are, can be very deep pockets, which of course should be also treated and cleaned from the sloughy material. This was the biggest wound which I ever treated. Uh, and the irony of the story was that the patient was hospitalized in the cardiovascular department of a modern hospital. And he was monitored with many super modern appliances. When I came to treat him with a very ancient method, the maggot therapy. As we know, Maggot therapy can be used as long as there is sloughy material inside the wound. Thereafter, any conventional method should be applied for the closure of the wound, including skin grafts, as it can be seen in case of this patient. In every occasion, we requested the help of the surgeons to remove the large necrotic parts of the wound, especially after a cycle with maggots when the necrotic tissue, as said before, was partially detached from the living one. It was a question of minutes for a surgeon to remove the necrotic parts of the wound and very often even 
without any anesthesia, as we are talking about necrotic tissue. Thereafter, maggots were used to debride the wounds, the, uh, the more superficial parts of the remaining necrotic tissue. It is clear that for our wound to heal, or at least to not increase in size and the neighboring living tissue, any necrotic part of the wound should be removed, either surgically or biologically. This includes removal of fechal, biofilms, scars, calluses, necrotic tissues, foreign bodies, gangrene, and so on. Without removal of these components, a healing of the wound could not be attained. With other words, without debridement, no disinfection, no granulation, no growth, no tissue oxygenation, no angiogenesis, and with other words, no healing. What are the side effects of maggot therapy? In general, it is difficult to accept a treatment with maggots, which has a connotation of death. Therefore, we should take the time and talk to patients with empathy. We should tell him about the success rate of wound cleaning with maggots, case of maggot therapy worldwide, and those treated by us, and that he, she can expect an improvement of his, her wound within one or two days, which could increase the chances of wound healing closure, diminish significantly the bacterial load, and accordingly, the danger of sepsis, stop the negative process of an ever-growing wound, which can be also the reason for increased pain. Please try to tell as little as possible what a maggot is. Change immediately the subject, even if the patient insists to know more about the maggots. Talk, if you want, about small creatures which are doing wonders and change immediately the, don't, the, the subject, don't start telling that there are larvae of flies, etc., etc. In any case, only a very low number of patients refuse to be treated with maggots. Escaping of maggots can occur, cage maggots can escape while dislocating the patient in bed and so tearing apart the adhesive bands. This could be the case when the cage-like dressing is placed close to anus and genital organs where the excess liquids could disconnect the adhesive bands from the skin. It should be, however, taking consideration that maggots are strongly attached to feces. Maggots, which finish feeding, will have the strong tendency to leave the wound in order to arrive to a dry place to pupate. Escaping maggots can cause a lot of emotional problems to patients, family members, and health prov providers. For this and many other reasons, such as removal of the maggots, if there is no more necrotic tissue to remove, to replace the already soaked and bacterial loaded dressing, to see that the adhesive bands still keep in place the cage-like dressing, we are using whenever possible a 24-hour maggot cycle. On the other side, if the wound is not too deep, the concealed maggot technique could be used. Maggot excrete ammonia and when they are used in large quantities, it might cause fever. Be sh however sure that the patient does not have sepsis. Maggot can easily remove the clotting and so renew the bleeding of the wound. For example, soon after a surgical debridement, when the bleeding of the wound was stopped with conventional methods. And last pain, maggots with their two teeth, their movements on the wound, and most probably with their excreted enzymes, 
can cause additional pain. Circa 30 to 35 percent of our patients complained from increased pain while the in, with the initiation of maggot therapy. Therefore, patients should be informed before the beginning of treatment that in some cases, but not necessary in all cases, the existing pain could decrease. And to alleviate the pain, they could be treated with appropriate analgesics and that maggots could be removed at any time if the pain becomes too strong. It should be taken also in consideration that the bigger the maggots, the more intensive could be the pain. Many patients start suffering from increased pain in the middle of the night, and this should be taken into consideration. One of the problems which we are confronting when, when we start treating a wound which was previously treated with other treatment modalities is the maceration of the wound and or skin. Maceration of the skin, of course, occurs after spending too much time immersed in a hot bath. This caused by absorption of water by the outer layers of the skin, which cause softening, swelling, and wrinkling of the epidermis. Uh, proteolytic enzymes, which are used in some treatment modalities, when they are used in great quantities and left for long periods of time, and also in areas where the skin is intact, they could cause also maceration. The use of watery disinfectants in large quantities and heavily ex excude, exuding ulcers could cause maceration of the skin if the superfluous liquids are not absor absorbed properly with an appropriate dressing. Also, long-lasting presence of urine and feces on the skin surface can cause diaper dermatitis and also uh, maceration. It is known that urine and fecal enzymes such as urease, proteases, and lipases can have a macerating effect on the skin. And what, why I'm telling all these things about maceration the skin is more susceptible to physical damage. You can remove layers of the skin just by trying to clean or dry the wound or the area. The skin wound is more susceptible to bacterial infections and the granulation and healing process of the wound is impaired. During maggot therapy, uh, the patient could continue taking any medication or be treated with our treatment modalities which are necessary for his health, such as the use of antibiotics and anticoagulants and having dialysis. Margos are resistant to hyperbaric oxygen treatment and accordingly patients can enter the chambers while being treated with maggots. However, no disinfectants, gels and or creams should be applied to the wound before or during maggot therapy. I will tell you a little bit about what was done in Israel. Uh, I started treating the patients in, 96, in 1996. In 2011, this treatment modality was up, accepted by the health authorities here in the country. And between 2012 and 2019, disinfected maggots were produced by a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I told you that I treat personally 600 patients and uh, together with our other physicians, uh, over 3,000 patients were treated during this period. Little more than 50% of the patients were males and 45% females. Their age ranged between two and 100 years. Most of the patients were 67 years old of the patients were treated while they were hospitalized while the remaining 50% ambulatory. The 3,000 patients had all, over 4,800 wounds, average 1.6 wounds per patient. The large, vast majority of the wounds were 
locate on the legs, 8% on as pressure or source on the back of the patients and legs. And in a few cases, we had also some hand ulceration. Close to 50% of the patients had diabetic foot ulcers, another 20% venous stasis ulcers, 9% different vascular diseases. And in this 23% of the patients, there were approximately 30 different disease, background diseases. Uh, as it is not important for maggot what causes the wound as long as there are stuffy material which they can fit and clean. The wounds are existing between one and 240 months, in average 8.9, median four. Number of treatments was one to 48, average three, median two, and the period of treatment one to 81 days. I would stress that these numbers, 48 and 81, it was for the very first patient I told you about. Today, uh, we are treating patients between one to four days in average. In about 82% of the, of the case, we succeed having a complete treatment, in another 15% a partial treatment, while 3.3% of the wounds remained unchanged. Some important uh, uh, points which should be discussed is that uh, after maggot therapy, the wound could appear bigger when the necrotic parts are removed. Uh, maggot therapy might help to decide, for example, the orthopedist, whether an amputation necessary or not, when the maggots cleaned part of the necrotic tissue and arrived to the deeper layers of the wound. And then it is much easier to see how, how deep the damage is. I cannot discuss about that, about, but the use of iodine and long-term use of antibiotics should be avoided where possible. Combination, uh, uh, we should think to combine maggot therapy with leech therapy to improve the blood circulation. And as with practical lifting X, also collaboration with specialists from other departments, such as the diabetologists, plastic surgeons, orthopedics, dermatologists, et cetera, is of paramount importance. In conclusion, maggot therapy can be applied for all kinds of wounds, diabetic foot ulcers, pressure sores, et cetera. Maggots can clean the most hidden place of the wound, like sinuses, pockets under the skin, and so on. Selective debridement of the sloughy necrotic tissue without damaging the healthy tissue, including both vessels blood vessels and tendons, patients could be treated ambulatory or while hospitalized. I talk about the side effects, but most of the time are minor. Other is effective in quickly debriding the wound. I think I gave you enough examples how quickly a um, wound can be debrided and decreasing considerably the bacterial load. We, didn't, uh, we did a lot of work about the uh, antibacterials with the uh, maggots secrete and, uh, and neutralize all kinds of bacterial gram positive and gram negative while enhancing the granulation and healing of the wound. Uh, maggot therapy prevent dissemination of the necrosis to the surrounding tissue this therapy can significantly reduce suffering and complications to, due to chronic wounds and save legs, feet from amputation. It can also reduce the overall antibiotic use, prevent hospital admission, and decrease the number of outpatient visits. It's a, therefore, it's a cost-effective treatment modality and may save save medical costs related to wound treatment. I think after all that, I, can, I was able to show you that maggots are something extraordinary 
and I would be happy to answer any kind of question if there are such. Thank you. Thank you, Costa. That was really nice. Thank you, Dr. Mumchoglu. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking through the chat and the Facebook page, and I do not see any questions. Wow. Um, I have a few questions sure. uh, while we're waiting for some more questions. Um, perhaps we can unshare the desktop. Um, okay. And then be able to see if there's anyone else also who has questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, and then uh, Albert will keep monitoring the chat box as well as the Facebook um, page to help us out. That was a spectacular uh, discussion. Uh, I agree with uh, with everyone else. Um, and so some of my questions uh, concern some of the items that you mentioned in uh, the talk that I wrote down here. So I'm gonna read my question. Um, first question I had was uh, about your comments on maceration, which can happen from a lot of causes and sometimes happens under the maggot therapy blessing as well. Uh, what are the methods that you or your colleagues use to prevent maceration in maggot treated uh, patients or minimize the occurrence of maceration? Adding a lot of pets and ghosts on the, on the on the on the wound you know and on the dressing and uh, especially it would be important when maggots are left more than 24 hours then as you know the those pets become quite soaked with all the excretion of the of the wound or of the maggots and of course the drainage is much less effective and we are doing that way that we put some wet goes directly on the wound and then a lot of layers of dry, dry uh, pads and dressing in order to absorb, to make a kind of drainage and take out all these liquids because of the maceration, but even more so to remove mechanically all the bacterial load, you know, and that all these liquids will not stay on the wound. So for those who are not as familiar with the dressings, um, there are often layers of absorbent gauze or other absorbent pads um, within, but also outside of the cage uh, element of the dressing to wick or absorb those secretions outwards. They help to prevent the maggots from drowning. They help prevent the accumulation, as you just mentioned, of the, of the uh, drainage and the liquids on the skin, and also help prevent that drainage of liquefied necrotic tissue, infection, and so forth from dripping down the patient's body, um, we find that if you add too many layers of absorbent dressings, then it can impede uh, oxygen flow into the maggots, especially if they're left more than 24 hours. And in the United States, these dressings, dressings are usually done for 48 hours some people even do it for 72 hours and um, there isn't enough oxygen that can go through a wet dressing. So it needs to be um, not too thick and to change. Uh, well, there's, there's another method that we use in the US I'll share with you. And that is the use of skin protectants. Usually these are uh, liquid 
plastics like uh, poly, polyurethane, I think, um, that are sp spread on the wound, commonly produced in wound care to prevent diaper rash, uh, incontinence rash, maceration for other causes, we will usually spread that over the skin around the wound before applying the maggot dressing. And in Europe, as you know, a very common method is the application of zinc oxide around the wound to help uh, prevent maceration. So those are uh, three different steps uh, that are commonly, uh, uh, commonly used. Thank you. Albert, any questions coming in? No, Dr. Sherman, I don't see any questions still. So continue well, with your questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, you know me, I'm loaded with questions. It's um, nice and good. You also mentioned that maggot therapy can help determine whether amputation is necessary. Can you please elaborate on, on that? You know, that was my, uh, my experience. Uh, it was always, uh, the physicians were discussing the case of a given patient, whether it should be amputated or not. Now, it was really, and I hope in most cases, uh, that uh, after treatment, the, the physicians suddenly come to the conclusion that after all, it could be weight, you know, it's amputation not immediately necessary. And in my opinion, I took it, uh, I took it, uh, you know, as a result of the maggot therapy, because before it was uh, discussed to amputate the leg. Now, it was about also cases, which they also discussed whether they should amputate or not. And when we started treating and the maggots entered deeper and deeper, you know, and they come to, to the bone and uh, we saw how deep the wound was and how the, the different layers were destroyed, you know, then it was easier to the physician to decide uh, make an amputation. So they were much more sure that an amputation is necessary. That's what I tried to explain. Of course, um, the decision was always those of the physicians, but uh, I think it helped in some cases to, to take the necessary step and decision. So if I could share um, another perspective of that very same issue, uh, as a clinician, we recommend amputation when we believe that that wound, that that limb or area cannot be saved. More than just the wound not be healed, um, if we believe that it's going to advance, if it's going to endanger the entire limb, if it's going to endanger the life of the patient, if um, the infection of the wound is going to spread, those are uh, reasons along with just sometimes never going to be able to heal, even if we clean it out, you end up with a big hole, but it still won't heal. Those are the reasons we use to, uh, uh, as determining factors to amputate. Um, interestingly, in published studies, one of which was yours, uh, the one that we did jointly on outpatients, uh, in published studies of patients who were determined to require amputation for a non-healing wound, but given maggot therapy as a last resort, uh, 40 to 70% of those patients 
healed their wounds with the maggot therapy and, of, and did not need amputation. And several additional ones uh, required a much smaller surgical resection, not the uh, extensive amputation that was originally planned. And so on the basis of that, I often share the same thought that you expressed in your lecture, that maggot therapy can be helpful to determine which wounds actually can heal and which ones will not. That a trial of maggot therapy uh, on patients who do not need emergency amputation uh, is, is worth taking because if the maggots will completely debride that wound and you can see a healthy base of the wound afterwards, that wound is likely to heal and does not need an amputation. And if our rate is 50% or better, then that means at least 50% of amputations could be potentially avoided if given a, a trial of maggot therapy. Uh, so we, we use maggot therapy sometimes for the very same purpose that you described to give them a chance to heal, to see where the base of the wound is, to see how extensive it is. And for me, if I don't see a clean, healthy base within three treatments, three cycles of maggot therapy, um, I figure it is it is much deeper and is likely to require amputation. Um, but if three cycles of maggot therapy can reach at least somewhere a, a clean base, then there's a good chance that amputation can be avoided. So we have the same experience. Mm -hmm. Anyone else with similar experience or or wishing to to share something like that? I can tell just uh, that it was also that there were also situations where a, an amputation was immediately necessary, but uh, the patient was not the overall health of the patient did not allow an amputation. His uh, let's say his heart was not strong enough for uh, such an operation, etc., and anesthesia, and in which case uh, a, the patient was uh, really in a desperate uh, position. But uh, there were also cases, believe me, that the physicians didn't know what to do. They tried all the, all the uh, possible treatment modalities, you know, for wound healing. And when I arrived, I knew also that also maggots in this specific case cannot do much about, but then uh, you know, there are situations which you, you don't have if you want the choice. Although I knew it that if at all, it must be some drops in the, in the sea uh, treating with maggots, but uh, on the other side, we couldn't do differently, but treat and give any chance to the patient, you know, to, uh, he was either dying in coma, etc. but uh, still we treated, although we knew it that, also, maggots cannot change the situation. I think your experience, you with your experience, deserve an honorary medical degree <laughs> because you are experiencing, you are now expressing a very common situation uh, that clinicians have, uh, you have few options. You want to do something. You, uh, we follow uh, the uh, uh, Hippocrates rules, including above all else, do no harm. Maybe it has benefit, maybe not. But if it doesn't harm the patient, it's worth a try. 
And that's exactly what you're describing. That's exactly what you're, um, uh, that you're expressing that you experience too. How are we on time and questions, Albert? Uh, we are good on time. Um, three more minutes till two. There are no questions on the uh, Facebook live stream or in the Zoom chat. Just for my curiosity, how many people are following? Uh, on the Facebook uh, live uh, chat, I think it fluctuated between one to two in the last hour. Two people. And we have... And we have uh, four members noted uh, on, uh, on our Zoom call here, uh, but many, many more will tune in to the recorded version. Uh, okay. Usually within the first week, there are four to six times as many uh, views on the recorded uh, sessions. Um, and I'm Amazing. sure many people will tune in to this one. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for everything and uh, I hope Mago Therapy will continue and will uh, will be used more and more in all kinds of countries uh, we did a long way you know since we started you started of course in uh, first and uh, I followed you uh, in Israel and in the last uh, 20 so years we came quite far away, far, uh, we succeed quite a lot of things regarding maggot therapy and I hope that it will continue in this way. Well, I, I actually have one more question <laughs> for sure, you. Sure. Uh, I know it's very late for you. It's, no, no, it's, no, it's, okay. uh, it's okay. it must be midnight, yeah, uh, exactly. almost midnight. Yeah. Uh, but I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on what you predict in the, la in the next 10 years, in the next decade, what do you think will be the major new, new achievements of maggot therapy? Or on the other hand, what do you think are the major obstacles that we are that we will still need to, but will overcome, will overcome in the next 10 years? Well, I think that uh, a lot of people thinking that uh, working with the uh, excretion secretions of the maggots, you know, and if you want to get rid of maggots and use only their products to treat the wound, which will be of course more aesthetically more acceptable, etc. cetera. Uh, there are surely a lot of, to be done about the antibacterials of the maggots, which, they are, which are, was shown so many times that they are very effective in neutralizing gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Uh, we know that uh, more and more countries, people in countries are using the maggot therapy uh, we know also the difficulties of such a treatment modality. Uh, uh, one of my thoughts, and I we discussed that that uh, we should find the ways to educate uh, physicians uh, much better in international courses to to teach them how to use maggots optimally use the maggots to as, as few mistakes as possible to, to be more aggressive with the maggot therapy. Uh, I tried to explain at the beginning that because I didn't have enough experience, I was using very low numbers of maggots. But later I realized uh, according to the size and depth of the wound, how many maggots should be treated or optimally used for how long, how should be left. And as I said, it was uh, 
very advantageous that I opened the wound after 24 hours to see what the situation of the wound is, whether it's necessary to add maggots, to remove maggots, etc. Uh, I don't know if I uh, answered as it should be your question. Uh, of course, I hope that it will be uh, more and more used. And uh, But uh, for this, as I told you, uh, we have to organize international courses with certificates and, and uh, attract people interested to do that and have the necessary uh, uh, necessary information and uh, I, to apply correctly the maggots to the wounds. And of course, we have to collaborate with, uh, with uh, uh, companies which will be interested to produce such sterile maggots I'm talking now for the different countries and uh, they can push much easier, you know, that kind of products and we can do it with our own uh, middles, uh, with our way, because we are too much in, involved with patients and uh, in research and we don't have this possibility to to, to be so as aggressive as a company which tries to make some money from the whole business and we need to collaborate with them to have uh, much, to get better results. Well, thank you. That not only answers my question, but is a, a great inspiration. Your thoughts there are great inspiration for all of us. So with that, I'll let you get to bed <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll close the meeting. Thank you all who attended and anyone who who watches uh, later, be sure to catch uh, other programs on Facebook or on YouTube uh, that the Better Foundation is putting out. You can uh, go to the Better Foundation's Facebook page or website, but also check out the International Biotherapy Society and some of their programs and resources on, the, on their website. Uh, with that, let me say good night and goodbye to all. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.